Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Das Criminal Podcast. Yeah, and this one is special because we're finally ending our long series about the Arab Spring. Yeah, we definitely might circle back in the future. So, reportedly, when asked his opinion about the French Revolution by visitors in Shanghai in 1972, Chinese Premier Zhu Enlai responded that it was too early to say. But unfortunately, that reported context is probably false. Zhao was likely referring to the French students' revolts in 68. But still, I feel like it's an apt way to describe our theses on Syria and the Arab uprisings too early to tell. Yeah, I think it's been, what, now 10 years, exactly 10 years. But it's still ongoing insofar as there has been no definitive conclusion. So it's hard to say what's going to happen next. Right. And even in the context of the French Revolution, I'm sure revolutionaries at first were like, aha, we got them. And then there was, of course, like Napoleon and then the Bourbon Restoration. And they were like, oh, damn. But like now still we regard it as like a pivotal moment in time for Western Europe, at least. Yeah, I mean, with with the French Revolution, it's funny because they're now on what? Their Fifth Republic? It's like, you know, if you fail, try and try again until you succeed. Mm-hmm. And by the way, France, keep trying. You're not there yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, by, by nowhere near there. So I've wanted to do this case for a really long time. Like, I think it's actually been on our brainstorming list since like we started the podcast. And it might seem strange or even remissive to include a case heavily covered in Western media in our series on Syria. But still, I think it's imperative we use this case to sort of analyze that media coverage and how the uprising in Syria spiraled into an international crisis. And there are definitely more cases that we could look at in the future regarding the war in Syria. But at this time, we really just don't have enough information to give them the deep dive that they all deserve. On February 17th, 2015, three teenage girls from Bethnal Green, London, boarded a flight at Gatwick Airport for Istanbul, Turkey. The schoolgirls, Amira Abbas, Shamima Begum, and Khadiza Sultana, weren't headed for a Mediterranean holiday. They were en route to Syria to join the Islamic State, otherwise known as ISIS or Daesh. Definitely not Ibiza. Mm-mm. The news shocked the British public. Though thousands of men, and at least dozens of women, had already traveled from Europe to Syria and Iraq to join jihadist organizations, the idea that three straight-A students would run away from home to join a terrorist syndicate seemed incomprehensible. So why did Amira, Shamima, and Khadiza leave their relatively guarded lives in East London to join the Islamic State? What has happened to them in the meantime? And, most important to our discussion of the Syrian civil war, What is to be done with the ISIS members who remain? The great sequel to Lenin's What is to be Done. So, to at least try and comprehend what might persuade three London schoolgirls to travel to a war zone, we need to dig a bit into their lives before leaving. Azeta Mulvaney's book, Guest House for Young Widows, Among the Women of ISIS, is a helpful resource, though it's clear at some parts she takes some artistic liberties. Mulvaney tries to paint a more sympathetic picture of the so-called Brides of Isis. We're going to discuss this interpretation throughout the episode, though I'd say there's always room for more empathy in politics. I want to clarify that my sympathies first extend toward the Yazidi women and girls and other ethnic and religious minorities persecuted by the Islamic State. Yeah, and I also think it's very difficult to express sympathy for the Bethnal Green girls, considering they themselves don't seem regretful of their actions. And if anything, they're behaving as if they're sorry they were caught, not sorry for doing what they did. So actually, the Bethnal Green Trio might best be described as the Bethnal Green Quartet, as before Amira, Shamima, and Khadiza traveled to Syria, their friend, Sharmina Begum, made the journey. Now, there's no familial relation between Sharmina Begum and Shamima Begum, actually, 
Begum is a Muslim title, but has been adopted as a surname in places like Bangladesh and Pakistan, especially by unmarried women. Sharmina and Shamima both have Bangladeshi heritage, which explains their use of the name Begum. So Sharmina Begum grew up in a small council flat in Bethnal Green, East London, with her mother, grandmother, and maternal uncle. For our listeners outside the UK, council housing typically refers to public housing built by local authorities. Someone who lives in council housing can be assumed to be working class. The family had initially planned for Sharmina's father to join them in the UK, but since the government imposed an income threshold for spouses coming to Britain, the family couldn't meet the requirements, and Sharmina's dad had to stay in Bangladesh. As a result, Sharmina didn't really know him aside from phone conversations. That income threshold, by the way, is £18,600. I personally know people who have been affected by this law, and it's incredibly classist. If you make below a certain amount of money and marry someone who is not also a UK citizen, you cannot bring that person to the UK on a spouse visa. Of course, this law disproportionately affects poor people of immigrant backgrounds who might be more likely to meet and fall in love with someone from their country of origin. If you can't work because you're disabled or a full-time student or something like that, or you just can't find a high enough earning job in your area with your education and skills, then you're fucked. Absolutely ridiculous. There's also such an arbitrary cutoff limit to choose. Like, imagine making £18,500 and being denied a visa over 100 quid. Sharmina's father was able to join the family in 2007, but he hadn't been a significant presence in her childhood and she likely felt much closer to her mother. In late 2013, or early 2014, Sharmina's mother tragically passed away from lung cancer. She was only 33 years old. There were only about six months between her diagnosis and death, and during this period, teenage Sharmina watched her mother wither away. After this, Sharmina's father managed to secure a council flat in Shoreditch, but he had to work long hours as a waiter to make ends meet, and Sharmina was often by herself. Heartbroken by her mother's death and feeling alienated in a home that no longer seemed like a familiar place, Sharmina turned to her religion for comfort. She began spending more time at her local mosque, the East London Mosque in Whitechapel. In 2014, Sharmina's father took her on Hajj, the holy pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina, and one of the five pillars in Islam. Hajj was a riveting spiritual experience for Sharmina, as it's intended to be. She forged a deeper connection to her faith with the trip. It's also a ridiculously lucrative cash cow for the Saudi government, and why, um, yes, I am atheist, but I do want to go for the anthropological curiosity, but I will not go on Hajj while the Sauds remain in power. Soon after that, in the autumn of 2014, some other women at the East London Mosque, who called themselves the Sisters Forum, began talking to Sharmina. Her family now believes that these women were grooming Sharmina convincing her to leave Britain and travel to Syria to live under the Islamic State. According to Movaini, these women began texting and calling Sharmina regularly and invited her to women-only study groups. That's grimly funny to me because my first reaction as Sharmina would have been, well, why haven't you fucked off and joined them then, you know? Like, if someone tells you to do something and they're not doing it themselves, then how much do they believe in it? Right, hypocrites, for sure. Channel 4 released a documentary called ISIS, The British Women Supporters Unveiled, in 2015, where a young woman infiltrates one of these study groups and records the leader expressing explicit support for the Islamic State. The undercover woman, who is also a Muslim, is horrified by this. Of course, most Muslims in the UK and worldwide oppose the Islamic State as a fundamentalist, genocidal cult. Still, it is disturbing how quickly an at-risk teenage girl could find herself in a circle of radical Islamist women who are willing to exploit her trauma to convince her to join ISIS. This is why I'm a lot more curious by certain French secular laws that are being written these days that seek to like absorb mosques into like official regulatory frameworks, whereby, according to these laws, the imams must have government licenses to operate. And yes, I see how such a thing is problematic, but leaving mosques to operate outside the realms of state control leaves them very vulnerable to infiltration by extremists. For one, the Saudis spend billions of dollars to export their ideology to Muslim communities worldwide, and one way they do this is by training imams and sending them back to work in these mosques. I don't think that the Macron government is an ideal arbiter of what constitutes good Islamic content either. 
But I do understand the desire to more stringently regulate uh, what is taught in mosques and madrasas in a way that I would argue is not too dissimilar to the regulation of normal schools under, you know, district school boards and a ministry of education. Yeah, it is concerning that it didn't take very long after Sharmina's mother's death for her to be brought into this very extreme group, like almost as though they were watching and waiting. Yeah, and I think, I don't, I don't want to say if there was more regulation of mosques, this wouldn't have happened. But I feel like these groups sort of exist in these mosques, and they exist for a long time. And there's no, there's no accountability, there's no, you know, supervision of any kind. Well, when I was an undergraduate in 2017, I wrote a paper about ISIS's online propaganda targeting women and girls. And during my research, I was able to find fundamentalist social media accounts quite easily. And also to the FBI agent monitoring my online activity, please know this was for academic purposes and I have never thought about joining ISIS. But I'm going to quote from that paper to summarize how ISIS recruits women online. Quote, Islamic State uses technology to draw Western women and girls to its territory. Women already allegiant to its objective of creating a reactionary Islamic caliphate in the Levant are at the forefront of this propaganda campaign. Most of these women utilize informal social media sites like Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter to post morsels of their daily lives or some intentional fabrication of them. From there, they contact young women who show interest in these messages to persuade them to make the perilous journey to ISIS terrain and provide specific instructions on how to do so while avoiding detection. Though determining exactly which women and girls are most vulnerable to such cajoleries is difficult, Indeed, even the most sophisticated government intelligence agencies in the world have been unable to recognize the risk factors for thousands of their own citizens until they have already departed. These women are at a specific experiential advantage. They have personally leapt from at-risk to radicalized. Social media platforms attempt to remove the accounts of ISIS supporters, but the process bears an ugly resemblance to pulling weeds. One can remove the undesirable plant, but unless every seed is destroyed, more weeds will appear. Each time their platforms are shut down, the women of ISIS find a new and less detectable means of disseminating their propaganda. At the time of writing, November 2017, a preliminary English language internet search will not uncover any of these accounts. However, it will retrieve the pseudonyms of well-known female ISIS recruits as they are mentioned in news articles. By simply translating these names into Arabic and entering them back into the search engine, specifically Google, I was able to access hundreds of social media pages that at first glance may seem innocuous, but actually represent the first step of a young woman's indoctrination into the Islamic State. Analogous to how young men are radicalized online, after a certain amount of interaction with these shadowy fronts and a demonstration of amenability for the cause, perhaps by engaging in ISIS-specific argo or lamenting about the spiritual impurity of life in the West, a young woman will be invited into private chats about the caliphate with sisters or friends who encourage her to travel to Syria and Iraq. End quote. If you're interested in reading the whole paper and looking at the screenshots I took of these social media pages, we'll put them on the podcast Patreon page. But to synopsize, it took me about an hour of looking around on Google to find Facebook pages geared toward women and girls expressing support for ISIS. An hour. Granted, I was looking for these pages. I didn't simply stumble across them. And, you know, I'm a researcher and an adult. But what if I were a teenage girl who had lost her mother and felt comfort in Islam? Would these pages have looked appealing to me? What if some women just a little older than me had started inviting me to study groups at the mosque? What if they became my friends and I trusted them? Also, I wonder what role the Facebook algorithm played in this. I mean, you know, like we all joke about Big Brother and all that and Skynet. And, you know, we've all had instances where, say, for example, I'm talking into this mic right now and I say, gee, I've been looking for shoes lately. And suddenly everything in your phone, all the ads are of her shoes. What if Sharmina is engaging with Muslim content and the cyclical nature of targeted advertisement would mean that they would be exposed to more and more Islamist content through this targeted advertising that may pave the way to more extreme sympathetic pages. I think people have definitely done studies on the YouTube algorithm, where if you search something that might seem innocuous, like, why is feminism bad? Within four clicks, you'll be in, like, an extreme Nazi page. 
Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I've, I've I've definitely had that where like it vomits out very specific targeted advertisement, and I think you know the methods by which Nazis and Salafists are radicalized online are quite similar. All of this being said, I think we can look at clues as a way to explain why Sharmina left London to join ISIS, but they just don't justify what she did. I mean, there is, in my opinion, a crucial distinction between a reason and an excuse. Plenty of teenage girls rebel or act out, I know I did, but there is a colossal gap between, say, skipping school or dressing outrageously and joining a terrorist organization. We're going to discuss this more toward the end of the episode. Sharmina began following the Tumblr account of a young woman named Aksa Mahmoud, who blogged under the nickname Um Umlaith. Aksa had left Glasgow about a year earlier for Syria and began posting online about her life in the caliphate. This is just a tangent, but it's so funny to me when converts, or in this case diaspora Muslims, get like really into being Muslim to the point of adopting a kunya. And a kunya is basically the Arabic honorific denoting an individual's children or parenthood. So like Abu X means father of X and Um X means mother of X. So in this case, Um Laith means mother of Laith. And like, you know, are their names not good enough for them? You don't have to change your name when you convert to Islam, by the way, just, just a heads up. Yeah, it is a bit of a weird thing and also not something that I usually associate with a woman in her 20s. Yeah, definitely. It's something that like, I'll be like, oh, this is a 60 year old from like, you know, uh, a village in Bahrain or whatever, not like a Glasgow girl. Yeah, like Abu Musa, the collaborator. Yeah. The Bethnal Green girls' families would later say Aksa Mahmoud was instrumental in radicalizing their daughters and convincing them to move to Syria. Reading Aksa's blog posts, one in particular stands out to me. Aksa writes about missing her mother, something Sharmina Begum, still grieving her own mum, could relate to. Quote, I miss my mother. And I want this to be a reminder to all of you to recognize the worth and value of your mother, because once you lose her, nothing will be the same again. While most of you can still see your mother's smile, I cannot anymore. While most of you can still put your head on your mom's shoulder, I cannot anymore. While most of you can still call out to your mother when you feel pain in your body, I cannot anymore. While most of you can still go and have that heart-to-heart talk with your mother, I cannot anymore. End quote. And I want to point out, I'm pretty sure Aksa is talking about missing her mom because she moved to join ISIS. I think her mother is alive. (laughs) That's funny. That's actually fucking hilarious. Right. But through Aksa's Tumblr and Twitter, Sharmina began to follow even more women who had joined the Islamic State, so-called Mahajarat in Arabic. They framed moving to the caliphate as fard, or Islamic duty. If you weren't at least considering leaving life in the West behind to travel to Syria and support the Islamic State, then you weren't a good Muslim in their eyes. Okay, to go on a tangent here, in the early Islamic period, and by the way, not to like self-advertise, but I did an excellent series on the history of Islam with the Radio Warner chaps. Check it out if you haven't already. The Prophet Muhammad preached the, the nascent religion in the city of Mecca uh, and he was persecuted for his preaching by the elites. And as the persecution got worse and possibly life-threatening, Muhammad and his followers fled Mecca to the city of Yathrib. The city is, of course, later renamed the Medina Munawara, which is Arabic for the Blessed City. And the event is called the Hijra, or the Migration. Um, and it's the start of the Muslim calendar. It's, it's a very pivotal event. Those who participated in the Hijra are called the Muhajirun, or the emigres. Um, and Muhajirat is the feminine plural of the term. Uh, But what's more interesting is that because this event is so pivotal in transforming Islam from an insurgency into a burgeoning nation, ISIS has latched on to this particular story and claims that because Muhammad and the early Muslims did a hijra, all Muslims must do a hijra themselves, specifically to the caliphate. It sort of guilt trips people to try and fudge the demographics or like build a population base. So the politics of Syria's civil war existed in these online conversations, but they were significantly skewed. ISIS supporters frequently claimed that Bashar al-Assad and the Syrian armed forces were killing Muslims. Now remember, adherents to the fundamentalist ideologies of the Islamic State believe that every person who is not an ISIS supporter is an infidel. As Sunni extremists, ISIS members do not consider Shia Islam as legitimate and have committed acts of genocide against Shia Muslims and other religious minorities. 
As Assad is Alawite, a Shia sect, ISIS distorts his and the Syrian government's military actions against them and other jihadist groups as massacres of Muslims. In this way, ISIS paints the Syrian civil war as a holy struggle. Truthfully, the Islamic State is the one exploiting a political vacuum in northern Iraq and Syria to brutalize the people there and create an ultra-reactionary society, not the other way around. On her Twitter account, Amira Abbas would post about oppressed Muslim children in Syria. It appears as though she sincerely believed that ISIS liberated Syrian and Iraqi people, which, as we all know, is not the truth. Sharmina apparently observed this propaganda as well, as at one point she defended the Islamic State to a teacher at Bethnal Green Academy. But the teacher never reported to anyone that Sharmina might be in danger of radicalization. Honestly, I can see both sides to this. Yes, a 15-year-old girl attempting to vindicate ISIS is incredibly concerning, but I also take issue with the idea of adults reporting Muslim youths for espousing certain beliefs. I just fear teachers could use this reporting mechanism to weaponize the state against, for instance, Palestinian students who vent opposition to Israel, or Black students who vocalize a hatred for cops. Lots of poor working class and people of color fear social services for this reason. Any perceived problems at home could severely disrupt a family's life, or even see children separated from their parents. I just think we should be extraordinarily cautious of expanding the state's power to surveil and police the lives of Muslim youth. In Sharmina's case, we now understand there was a lot more going on behind the scenes, but I don't think pressuring teachers to inform on their Muslim students is the right move. Yeah, I completely agree with the hesitation, uh, because what sort of intervention would the state conduct if Sharmina was reported? Because it's extremely difficult for me to see this British state as it currently is engaging is in any meaningful and pathetic form of de-radicalization, and anything like detaining her would just compound the problem and also violate her human rights. And this is something I struggle with in general, like the idea of reporting or punishing people for expressing some personal sympathy to an ideology or expressing some disdain for a particular person. Like, if I said that I hate Henry Kissinger, right, and I say that, personally, I say that I wish he would <laughs> should I be reported for intending harm on him? And if that's the case, what should be an appropriate reaction by the authorities to that? Yeah, it's a complicated question. And again, it's a hindsight is twenty twenty situation. And I also don't think putting everything on this teacher and saying, why didn't you report? Like, okay, that is just one domino and a line of dominoes falling down here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sharmina, Amira, Khadiza, and Shamima were good friends. They all attended Bethnal Green Academy, a predominantly Muslim school. According to their families and teachers, all four girls were conscientious students and popular among their peers. But at home, things weren't improving for Sharmina. Her father remarried in the autumn of 2014. Khadiza attended the ceremony as Sharmina's guest. Her father's new wife only spoke stilted English, and as she moved into the East London flat, Sharmina felt even more like a stranger. Watching her father remarry less than a year after her mother's death must have been really hard for Sharmina. And to be honest, it sounds like she really needed him and he was not there for her. It doesn't excuse joining ISIS, but I do feel awful for Sharmina at this point. Some reports say that Sharmina was living with her grandmother rather than her father after he got remarried. We don't totally know her family's circumstances. If my mother passed away and then my father quickly remarried and either wanted me to live with my grandmother or didn't seem to care either way, I would be absolutely devastated. This isn't to say that Sharmina's father is to blame for what happens next. He isn't. But I can really empathize with how Sharmina probably felt emotionally neglected by him. By December of 2014, Sharmina was planning her move to Syria. She asked her grandmother for some of the money the family had been given around her mother's death, and her grandmother, none the wiser to how Sharmina had been radicalized online and at the mosque, gave it to her. Sharmina and her three best friends, Amira, Khadiza, and Shamima, went shopping for supplies like cold weather gear before Sharmina's departure, suggesting that the other three were aware of her plan. Sharmina purchased a round-trip ticket to Turkey. ISIS recruiters advise travelers to do this to avoid detection by the authorities, as a one-way ticket to Turkey registers as suspicious. Yeah, and when we say authorities, we mean mainly the British authorities because the Turkish secret intelligence, the MIT, are very much aware of their country being a pipeline for ISIS recruits and pretty much actively facilitate their movement to Syria. 
um, they're pretty much culpable as much as anyone for enabling ISIS. That same month, December of 2014, Sharmina Begum left the United Kingdom and headed to Syria via Turkey. The former schoolgirl made it all the way to the caliphate, where, two weeks after her departure, she called her father to tell him she was never coming home. When he hadn't heard from her in a day or two, Sharmina's father called her cell phone. It connected him to a message in a language he didn't understand, and he called the police. This language was Turkish. Sharmina was on her way from the airport in Turkey to be smuggled into northern Syria. Sharmina's father and the police began connecting the dots and realized it was likely Sharmina had left the United Kingdom to join the Islamic State. Sharmina's father asked her friends if they knew anything about her disappearance, but they denied it. Whatever Sharmina had done, they said, she had done on her own. Meanwhile, teachers and administrators at Bethnal Green Academy were likewise concerned that Sharmina's friends had some knowledge about her radicalization and disappearance. They called Amira, Khadiza, Shamima, and four other girls to the office to meet with counterterrorism police. These police officers gave the girls letters to give to their parents so they could interview them about Sharmina's journey to the Islamic State. Amira, Khadiza, and Shamima just pocketed these letters and told their parents nothing. Bethnal Green Academy informed the girls' parents that Sharmina had gone missing, but they said nothing about the Islamic State or suggested that Amira, Khadiza, and Shamima might follow their friend. In Sharmina's case, one could argue that a vulnerable girl who lacked a stable home life and support system fell through the cracks. But this is not so true for Amira, Khadiza, and Shamima. There were signs of the girls' plans to leave the United Kingdom leading up to their departure, the most glaring one being Sharmina's disappearance before them. But the adults in their lives don't appear to have made a sincere effort to prevent their radicalization. There's a short Vice documentary you can watch on YouTube, it's just over 20 minutes long, titled The Girls Who Fled to Syria, Groomed by the Islamic State. The video features Amira Abbas's parents, who say they had no idea their daughter planned to run away and wonder why she would leave her life in the UK to join ISIS. I do find it interesting how the most likely demographic for radicalization is always second-generation emigres, either those born in the new country or those that migrate at a young age. And in a way, it's never the first generation because, like, you know, the dads and moms may be somewhat religious, but they actively seek to immigrate to Germany or the UK or the US or Canada. But their children, on the other hand, experience an existential crisis of sorts where they feel like they don't belong in the new country and latch onto an idealized version of their culture that may or may not be a reactionary. And then that fuels their desire for a sort of return to their roots. Right. A romanticization of the homeland. Yeah, exactly. Amira's father later came under media fire as it surfaced that he had attended a rally in 2012 protesting the film Innocence of Muslims. The rally was organized by Anjum Chowdhury, a notorious Islamist extremist in the UK who later served time for supporting the Islamic State. In 2013, her father took Amira to a rally outside the Saudi embassy in London to protest the violent expulsion of Ethiopian migrants from Saudi Arabia. Amira's father is a refugee from Ethiopia. Amira would have been aware of politics from a young age and how her family's identity as Ethiopian British Muslims shaped their lives. Many observers point to these protests as a radicalizing factor for Amira. I'm sure being present at events with fundamentalist preachers primed Amira for absorbing Islamic State propaganda as a teenager, but I don't think this ultimately explains why Amira left London, especially since her parents seem as though they were genuinely unaware of her intentions and wish she hadn't run away. I think there's actually a hidden clue in that short documentary that doesn't get enough attention. At one point, Amira's mother insists that she didn't neglect or disregard her child, unlike possibly Sharmina Begum's father. In fact, Amira's mother says she and Amira, and it appears the other siblings as well, shared a bedroom in the family's cramped council flat, and she kept a close eye on her daughter. So with this information, I don't think Amira felt abandoned by her family at all. I think she felt suffocated by them. What teenage girl wants to share a bedroom with her mother. I think that at school, Amira had teachers telling her that she was intelligent and capable of handling adult responsibilities, like preparing for difficult exams, maybe. But at home, she was sheltered by conservative religious parents. 
Yeah, thankfully I had my own bedroom growing up, but my mom felt free to walk into my room at any time without knocking, which genuinely got me mad, and so I understand the resentment that results from, you know, not respecting a teen's space and privacy. And, you know, some limits are good, kids do need attention, but suffocating them and not respecting their space does cause an equal and opposite reaction, as we see here. Right. And I was once that teenage girl who felt like I handled my responsibilities well and I achieved straight A's in school, but I still had limits placed on me by my parents, like curfews and constantly wanting to know my whereabouts, you know, pretty typical teenage stuff. But at the time, I resented it so much and would go out of my way to do adult things like wearing clothes I knew my parents thought were too grown up for me. And like, this isn't a unique experience by any means. Lots of teenagers rebel against their parents and, you know, resent being given responsibility without independence. I think this is how Amira and possibly Khadiza and Shamima felt. But of course, leaving London and joining the Islamic State is an extreme way to assert their independence in adulthood. But I don't think we can discount this as a factor in why the girls made the journey. And actually, one of the ways groomers lure teenage girls into their clutches is by saying things like, you're so mature for your age, your parents don't treat you fairly, they should recognize how grown up you are. And I think this is precisely what happened in the case of the Bethnal Green girls. Azeda Mulvaney writes in Guest House for Young Widows that an examination of Amira's social media demonstrates that she was on a clear path to radicalization. Quote, Any counterterrorism investigator reading Amira's Twitter account in December 2014 would have immediately realized what was going on. A series of interests, inferences, and views that, taken in combination, reflected a teenager being cultivated by savvy recruiters with one foot out of the door to Syria. Each post and tweet and image was a snapshot of her state of mind. I am getting political and pious and confused between the two. I am suddenly preoccupied with death and the afterlife. My interpretation of my religion is disturbingly narrow. I'm looking to learn Arabic. I'm admiring jihadi scholars whose work I cannot hope to understand. I am in love with the idea of a handsome jihadi husband. I am in love with the idea of being in love. I have yet to see a jihadi that is handsome, so that's a bit of an anachronism right there. Mulvaney continues, Anyone reading her Twitter account would have also been reminded that she was still a British child. Vans, yes or no? No. Chelsea forever, chocolate waffles, revision is killing me. This is Westfield Mall right now. Picking your A-levels is the hardest thing ever. My new socks are so nice, I want to cry. A photo of a tower of highlighter pens that she and Cadiza built together while studying. Anyone reading her Twitter account would have seen her announce, in late January 2015, her imminent departure. A selfie of her feet in black converses, wearing flowing black robes, with the caption, waiting, dot, 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 end quote. Like Sharmina and Amira, Khadiza Sultana didn't have a picture-perfect home life. She lived with her older sister and her mother, who was in ill health. Khadiza was a bright student and, according to her family, not noticeably concerned with politics prior to her radicalization. Shamima Begum, now perhaps the most infamous of the group, was actually the quietest. Her family recounts that she performed well at Bethnal Green Academy, and as a result, they felt no reason to fear for her welfare. Shamima began wearing a headscarf in year 10, when she was 14 or 15 years old, at her mother's request, suggesting her family is religious to some degree. Her other friends recall she was a fan of the Kardashians. Shamima later told Anthony Lloyd of the Times, quote, At the time I left the UK, I was slightly depressed. I didn't have a lot of friends. I wasn't really connected with my family. I couldn't speak about any problems I had, so it was easy to manipulate me. And people online were telling me, oh, your family don't pray. They don't listen to you. They won't listen to you if you tell them to pray and start practicing properly. They'll take you to hellfire if you stay with them. A lot of it was based on the fear of going to hellfire. End quote. On February 17th, 2015, a Tuesday, Amira, Khadiza, and Shamima told their families they were headed to the library to study. Instead, the 15- and 16-year-old girls went to Gatwick Airport and boarded a Turkish Airlines flight to Istanbul. They were on their way to join Sharmina in Syria. The CCTV images of the girls passing through Gatwick Airport security, wearing t-shirts and trainers, have since become infamous. When they arrived in Turkey, the three girls headed for the Bayram Pasa bus station. Following a long bus ride to the southern part of the country, they met their smuggler, John, 
who took them across the border into Syria toward the caliphate. Yeah, nothing says you're a good, pious Muslim who is devoted to the caliphate with a name like John. And yes, I know I was making fun of Muslims for changing their names, but it's also interesting that, you know, almost all converts that are like conservative or Salafist or, you know, support the Islamic State will change their name except this John character. (laughs) The girls' families soon discovered that they had not, in fact, gone to the library. Shamima Begum's sister called the police. The families then learned that their daughter's and sister's friend, Sharmina Begum, hadn't simply disappeared in December, but had run away to join ISIS. The families also discovered that counterterrorism police had spoken to their daughters at Bethnal Green Academy, but had left it to the girls themselves to inform their parents of their concerns about Sharmina's disappearance. Khadiza Sultana's sister later found the letter from police hidden in her room. The families were livid. How was the school and law enforcement aware enough of this risk to speak to the girls about their friend, but not concerned with alerting their families about the possibility of radicalization? The girls' parents hired a lawyer who specialized in counterterrorism cases to help them try and bring their daughters home. The girls and their families were ripped apart by the British tabloids. Right-wing nationalists used the story to bolster their racism, with agitators like Katie Hopkins writing for The Sun and Please be warned, what I'm about to quote for you is disgustingly racist. Quote, A note to jihadi girls' parents. You're to blame. Your daughters scurried off to be brides of jihad, sporting nothing more than a burqa and industrial lubricant. Parents who harbor future baby-making brides of jihad are a concern. Parents who don't even know that they have radical Muhammad makers in their house even more so. End quote. In the same article, Hopkins laments not being born in Australia, quote, where they repel immigrants with gunships, end quote. This is the type of absolutely horrid racism published in rags like the sun. Regardless your thoughts on the Bethnal Green Girls, Hopkins' outright revulsion toward immigrants and brown people should make your skin crawl. Gee, Katie, I wonder why Muslim women would feel alienated in a society that gives you a platform to spew your racist bile. Hmm. Meanwhile, the British media kept searching for someone to blame. It was the parents, the school, the mosque, the internet. By trying to pinpoint a single cause of the girls' departure, they missed the big picture. This was a systemic breakdown. The girls made an appalling decision, yes, but there were a lot of factors that went into that choice and the failure to prevent them from making it. The bitter truth is, All of these components led to the four girls' vulnerability to radicalization and eventual journey to Syria. Their less-than-perfect home lives, access to fundamentalist preachers online and at the local mosque, inattentive school administrators, inept police, and dependence on a tight-knit friend group where one member had already joined ISIS. As such, we must take a community-based approach to combat religious extremism. Just as surveillance and securitization haven't been proven to prevent violent crimes of any nature, they haven't been shown to impede youth radicalization. The PREVENT program, which aims to stop terrorism in the UK through community surveillance and reporting, has been largely unsuccessful. The Bethnal Green Academy girls are only a few examples of young people who fell through the cracks. Instead, PREVENT has created what law enforcement calls the pre-criminal space, essentially thought crimes or perceived thought crimes. Millions of pounds have been spent, and thousands of innocent, law-abiding people swept up in prevent because some public servant reported them. After the three girls' departure, police confiscated the passports of around 30 girls in East London deemed at risk of traveling to Syria. If they didn't have any evidence of these girls being a flight risk except being Muslim and knowing the girls who already left, that is guilt and punishment by association. CAGE, a grassroots organization working to end the oppression and injustices born out of the war on terror, instead recommends a community-based anti-radicalization framework that 1. addresses the root grievances from which violence draws strength, 2. counters disenfranchisement and alienation that hinders communities from organizing for their betterment, and 3. dismantles the repressive policy architecture established by prevent and counterterrorism. To the point about disenfranchisement, it's really telling that the media covered angles like the mosque and the parents and the teachers and so on 
but not the underlying socioeconomic issues, like Amira having to live in a very cramped council flat with her mom and her sisters all in her one bedroom. And I'm not saying that a bigger home would have been the single solution, but maybe if they lived in a place where she could have her own room, she may have felt more comfortable and therefore less amenable to grooming. Like, the government's spending million of, millions of pounds on this prevent program. Why don't you just divert some of that money and develop better public housing and, you know, find community programs to have people more invested in their immediate environment over a caliphate 5,000 miles away? Right. And as Alex S. Vital writes in The End of Policing, quote, The best way to avoid political violence is to enhance justice at home and abroad. Rather than embracing a neoconservative framework of retribution, control, and war, we should look to a human rights and social justice framework that seeks to ensure universal health care, education, housing, and food, as well as equal access to the political process, goals we are far from achieving. End quote. Prevent and anti-terrorism policing in the UK took another hit in its credibility when it was revealed that Sarah Khan, an anti-fundamentalism and women's rights activist, wasn't the genuine grassroots campaigner she claimed to be. Khan launched an anti-ISIS campaign in The Sun, the same tabloid that published Katie Hopkins' racist drivel we read earlier. Khan presented this campaign, called Hashtag Making a Stand, as a bottom-up Muslim feminist-led initiative but the public later discovered that it had actually been crafted by the Research, Information, and Communications Unit, a branch of the UK government's home office. Rather than seeing Khan as a community ally, Muslim women in the UK recognized her as a grifter, a government asset willing to portray herself as one of the good ones, while women and girls without the same celebrity are subjects of public scrutiny. Meanwhile, Sharmina, Amira, Khadiza, and Shamima were still in Syria and their families and communities were looking for answers about their safety. Khadiza Sultana's sister managed to contact her and begged her to come home, saying that she would not be in trouble with the authorities. Khadiza replied, they're lying. I mean, to be fair to her, I do sympathize with her mistrust of the British authorities. I'm sure she saw the tabloids like calling for her head. Yeah, pretty much. Khadiza also told her sister that she was living in a nice house in Syria, Quote, with chandeliers, end quote. Now this is where I start to lose sympathy for the Bethnal Green girls. That house belonged to a family in Syria, possibly a family that was murdered in one of ISIS's genocides or, you know, forced at gunpoint to flee. And Khadiza notes how comfortable that house is. In our discussion about this case, especially since Shamima Begum has resurfaced recently, we often lose sight of the Syrian and Iraqi people brutalized by the Islamic State. The tabloids do an outstanding job of making it seem like the UK or its citizens are somehow the victims of the Bethnal Green Academy girls. The actual sufferers are the Syrians and Iraqis, Kurds and Yazidis, Shia and Christians, and other religious minorities killed, tortured, and persecuted by the Islamic State, their homes, land, and communities occupied by this genocidal cult. Yeah, it does baffle me that little is said about the active genocides happening to Yazidis, Kurds, Shia, and Christians in Syria and Iraq, and the consequent secular colonialism of these radical emigres who sort of fly off to join the caliphate there. Right. The girls were very soon married off to ISIS fighters. They would have lived in these occupied houses, caring for their husbands as they went into battle, and likely having children. Reporters think Sharmina Begu married a man from Bosnia who has since been killed. Amira Abbas married an Australian man named Abdullah Elmir, a butcher from Sydney. Khadiza Sultana married a Somali-American and moved into a dilapidated mansion in Mosul, no doubt stolen from an Iraqi family. And Shamima Begum married Dutch-born Iago Radiek, a convert to Islam. Also keep in mind that the Islamic State allowed sex slaves, so in addition to being housewives, these girls likely actively participated, or at the very least, tacitly enabled the slavery of Yazidi, Assyrian, and other women that these brides' husbands may have owned and abused. Because, you know, in the caliphate, the fighters are allowed to marry four wives, but can own a number of sex slaves. And if you have sex slaves in your in the same house as your wife, I'm sure your wife must participate in enslaving those people. Or even domestic slaves. Yeah, exactly. Like, as in forcing them to do all the chores. When I was in Jordan in particular, there was a massive problem where a family, basically, the man would take a refugee girl as a quote-unquote second wife 
but actually she was being taken as a domestic slave for this family. That's fucking gross. Yeah. On June 26th, 2015, the Islamic State attacked beach tourists at the Port al-Kantawi Resort in Tunisia. 39 people, including the perpetrator, died. A reporter from the Daily Mail posing as a teenage girl interested in joining the Islamic State managed to contact Amira Abbas on Twitter. When asked about the attack in Tunisia, Amira responded, LOL. Amira told the undercover reporter, quote, Don't believe anything they say about Islam because they are the enemies of Islam and they will never speak good about it. Everything they say is a lie, trust me. Research, like read about it, end quote. Okay, Amira, I have done a lot of research, and ISIS is a Sunni fundamentalist murderous gang. I understand teenage girls want to act like they know it all, but this is really, really bad. Yeah, also not to go off with an Arabic nationalist tangent, but Islam was fundamentally born as an Arabic movement. So for these freaks to ask people to, you know, read about Islam when none of them can read or speak Arabic is hilarious. Because whatever translation of the Quran they read is fundamentally compromised because it's translation. Also, what are the odds that any of them know basic Islamic history? Oh my gosh, we did our little current criminal like bonus episode on this on the Patreon, but this Irish woman named Lisa Smith joined Islamic State. She used to be a soldier in Ireland working for the Air Corps. Joins Islamic State. She is found later, basically like Shamima, in the Al Hall refugee camp. And she tells a reporter, and I swear to God, this is how she says it. She goes about ISIS. Uh, it's like Yanni roller coaster. Go- you grew up in Ireland. You did not forget the word for roller coaster. Fuck off. <laughs> oh man, that is that is some real uh, LARPing right there. Yeah, it's so like, how do you not see through this? That is grim. I think we can simultaneously believe that the system failed in the cases of the Bethnal Green Girls and that Amira and later Shamima come off as callous in their exchanges about the crimes of the Islamic State. For the record, I don't think they seem like sensitive, caring, empathetic people. But that doesn't mean we should revoke the civil rights of entire communities and continue to pour money into counterterrorism programs that don't work. Soon after their move to Iraq, Khadiza Sultana's husband was killed fighting on the front lines. Khadiza began speaking more frequently with her family, broaching the idea of trying to return home. Her sister says that Khadiza was becoming disillusioned with ISIS. Khadiza's family suspects that Amira Abbas, who was still loyal to the Islamic State, discouraged Khadiza from trying to leave the caliphate. Khadiza moved back to Raqqa, and her family tried to arrange for smugglers to take her out of ISIS territory to somewhere where she would have a chance of returning to the UK. Whatever her plans may have been, Khadiza Sultana never made it out of Syria. In May of 2016, an airstrike hit her building. Sharmina Begum called her family and confirmed that Khadiza had been killed. After Khadiza's death, news about the Bethnal Green Girls pretty much dried up until February 13th, 2019 when the Times correspondent Anthony Lloyd found Shamima Begum at the SDF-controlled El Hal refugee camp in northern Syria. The story was sensational. At this point, Shamima had been in Syria for nearly four years. As someone who had followed the news about the Bethno Green Girls in 2015, I was shocked that she resurfaced after such a period of silence. According to Shamima, she lived in Raqqa until the SDF captured the city. She then fled several times and was in the last ISIS stronghold of Baguz before she left and ended up in the camp. When Lloyd finds Shamima, she is nine months pregnant with her third child. She tells him that her previous two children died from illness and malnutrition as they moved from place to place with the shriveling Islamic State. Her husband, Dutch convert Iago Radiak, was captured and, as far as I can tell, remains in prison with other ISIS fighters. Now, Shamima does not come off well in her initial interviews with reporters. She tells Anthony Lloyd that she lived a quote-unquote normal life in Raqqa overall. She also says, quote, I saw a beheaded head in the bin. It didn't faze me at all, end quote. Very cool. Yeah. She tells more than one journalist that she doesn't regret joining the Islamic State, but she wants to return home to the United Kingdom. She is most concerned about the safety and upbringing of her child. Going back to my earlier comments, it's hard to sympathize with someone who is so callous and obviously harbors no regrets for their behavior, their actions, and so on. 
Yeah, at this point, Shamima Begum is still deep into the ideology of the Islamic State and seems disappointed that the caliphate failed, but not disturbed by the crimes they committed against other people. A BBC reporter recalls, quote, When I asked her about the enslavement, murder, and rape of Yazidi women by IS, she said, Shia do the same in Iraq, end quote. That is not true, by the way. Shia do not do the same in Iraq. Also, what fucking excuse is that? Even if they did, and let me be clear, they don't, what does that have to do with enslaving Yazidi women who are, first of all, decidedly not Shia? And also, imagine doing a genocide and we're confronted, you're like, yeah, well, the Nazis did the same to the Jews in Germany. Like, that doesn't make it okay. Yeah, I want to empathize with Shamima here. I really do. But it's so difficult to watch her unemotionally recall her experience with the Islamic State even defend genocide and feel sorry for her. Like, I just, I can't. Yeah, I can't either. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. She seems aware of and yet indifferent toward the crimes ISIS committed against other people, particularly religious minorities. And it's really hard to feel for someone and the trauma they've been through when they appear to lack compassion for others. Perhaps Shamima Begum was brainwashed before and during her four years living under the Islamic State. In fact, I'd say this is likely. But we're talking about the slaughter of religious minorities here. At some point, people must be held accountable. The day after the news broke that Shamima Begum survived the end of the caliphate, UK Home Secretary Sajid Javid announced that the country intended to strip Begum of her British citizenship. Also as an aside, Sajid Javid has a very bald, shiny head, and I've always wanted to lick it. Amr. No, seriously, Google him. Just a very, very spherical head. Okay, put your tongue back in. (laughs) Okay. Since Begum's parents are Bangladeshi, the UK contends Shamima is eligible for Bangladeshi citizenship. Therefore, stripping her of her UK citizenship doesn't leave her stateless, which is illegal under international law. But Bangladesh says Begum does not hold Bangladeshi citizenship and would not be permitted into the country. Begum was born and raised in the UK. Her parents are Bangladeshi, but she has never lived there. Bangladeshi Foreign Minister Abdul Momin has stated Begum would face the death penalty in Bangladesh due to the country's zero-tolerance policy toward terrorism. So Bangladesh is not an option for her. Begum has told reporters she might pursue Dutch citizenship or residency through her husband, Yago Radiek. The Dutch government says they have no plans to repatriate either of them. Personally, I think stripping someone of their citizenship is a very dangerous legal precedent, and one I don't support regardless of the person's actions. If they did something terrible, even if they participated in genocide, they should be repatriated to their country of citizenship and be tried under the justice system of that country. I mean, every citizen should be given the right to a trial in their country and to remain a citizen, even though whatever legal punishment is mandated. Like, emigres who flew to join ISIS are now crammed in overpopulated camps, and they shouldn't be the problems of Iraq and Syria to deal with. They're your citizens to the UK and all. You should deal with them considering how badly you fucked up first place, letting them go so easily. Tragically, Begum's child, a son named Jarrah, died in the refugee camp of an infection a few days after his birth. Regardless your thoughts on Shamima and the things that she has done, that is an innocent baby. That's very tragic. Again, though, I don't want to limit our sympathies to Shamima and her child. Countless Syrian and Iraqi babies died of malnutrition, infection, and violence at the hands of the Islamic State. How often do you see Western media outlets shedding tears over the deaths of children in the Middle East? The state granted Shamima Begum legal aid to fight the decision to revoke her citizenship. On July 16, 2020, the Court of Appeal ruled that Begum could return to the UK to plead her case, basically saying that she couldn't correctly defend herself from a camp in Syria. But on February 26, 2021, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom in Begum v. Secretary of State for the Home Department overturned the Court of Appeals ruling, stating that Shamima Begum has no right to return to the UK, even relating to her court case. As it stands, Shamima Begum remains in the Roj camp. She moved from El Hall for her safety. Last month, pictures emerged of Shamima with uncovered, flat-ironed hair and Western clothes, a blunt contrast from her black conservative attire when Lloyd first found her in 2019. Clearly, Shamima has parted with at least some of the Islamic State's ideologies. I would say she looks like any other 21-year-old woman, but she doesn't. She's aged really dramatically, I'm guessing from a combination of her experiences in Syria and just literally spending too much time in the hot sun. 
Yeah, I googled photos in researching this episode, and she aged like warm milk in the summer sun. Like, she looks at least 50. And she is a good case that kids, you should always moisturize and use sunscreen. Yeah, I'm sure Shamima's lawyer has since told her how important it is to at least try and earn back the sympathy of Brits, something she didn't do in her 2019 interviews. But that doesn't necessarily mean this change is genuine. I mean, even if it is, it comes about two years too late for Shamima. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me now to determine if she's genuinely changed or if she's just playing her odds in terms of the British justice system. I mean, I'm not scared of Shamima Begum. Like, if I found out she lived in my building, honestly, I'd be like, damn, that's really weird. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I don't know. She's a fucking 21-year-old. Like, I could take her. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think I think you could take her. Like, I'll put my money on you, to be fair. But we still have to address a few questions. The first and most conspicuous being, what should happen to Shamima Begum and other foreign jihadists who join terrorist organizations like the Islamic State? My biggest issue here, and the reason I wanted to include this case in our series about Syria, is that in discussing what we should do about Shamima Begum, we've almost entirely decontextualized her actions and the actions of those like her from the conflict in Syria and Iraq and most crucially, the violence committed against those communities. The British tabloids and Home Secretary have somehow managed to make the citizens of the United Kingdom the victims of Shamima Begum, as though she and her friends betrayed them when they left the country. But there are real victims and survivors of the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, the people whose homes were stolen and occupied by the likes of Shamima Begum, and whose enslavement, torture, and murder didn't seem to register on Begum's emotional thermometer. Has anyone even considered justice for those people, like the Yazidis? On the topic of repatriation, have we thought about how there's a media frenzy around one girl, while hundreds of thousands of people have died and millions more are refugees whose communities have been destroyed? Syria is not your jihadist playground. An uprising is not your cue to found an experimental caliphate on the genocides of religious minorities. Additionally, Shamima Begum was a minor when she was groomed in the United Kingdom and left for Syria. Should that factor into our analysis of this case? I think we should generally consider age and other factors of vulnerability when discussing crime and accountability. I believe in second chances, so long as someone demonstrates genuine remorse and willingness to change. That being said, I'm not sure Shamima Begum has shown compassion for the victims of ISIS, which really, really worries me. I have noticed a tendency among some on the left to demand forgiveness and rehabilitation for people, and especially young people who cause harm, up to and including murder. But some of these same leftists will vilify people who said harmful or problematic things in the past, even if those people have apologized and taken steps to atone for the harm caused. You can't have it both ways. Either we accept that people can change or we don't. Yeah, for some people, saying the N-word in like 2011 when you're 14 is apparently worse than joining ISIS. I do genuinely believe that Shamima Begum and her friends are victims of grooming and also that they need to be held accountable for living in houses stolen from people. People who were probably murdered, by the way. Oh, yeah. Regarding the revocation of Shamima Begum's citizenship specifically, I think it sets a dangerous precedent, as Amr said before. First, the UK wouldn't have even been able to take this action if Shamima Begum didn't possibly have a claim to citizenship elsewhere through foreign parents. That is, if she had an entirely British family background, revoking her citizenship would make her stateless and therefore could not happen. Furthermore, I fear what this ruling means for Brits with dual citizenship or foreign-born parents. It sends the message that if you step out of line, the government could cancel your citizenship. In this case, we might agree with the reason, joining a foreign terrorist organization, but what about people in the north of Ireland, for instance, who all have the right to hold Irish citizenship? Should the UK remove their citizenship if they engage in anti-government political activities? Yeah, also, it's a very sleazy way to offload a country's problem, in my opinion, and in this case, basically dump these freaks onto Iraq and Syria to deal with, like, a basic aspect of modern statehood is being responsible for your citizenry and that responsibility doesn't just end uh, or arbitrarily be curtailed for any particular case. Yeah, and Shamima Begum can't stay in the refugee camp forever. I mean, I guess actually looking at how long has it been since the Nakba, like 73 years, maybe she fucking can. Maybe they're going to make eternal refugees out of these people, but like they shouldn't. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not for lack of trying, let's say that. Questions also loom about Sharmina Begum and Amira Abbas. Their whereabouts are currently unknown to the public, at least. Shamima Begum says she last spoke to them a few years ago. I think there are a few possibilities, keeping in mind they probably didn't meet the same fate as each other. First, they died in an airstrike or during the fighting or of starvation or illness while fleeing. This is the most likely scenario, in my opinion. Second, they live in camps or prisons somewhere without disclosing their identities, possibly fearing they'll be targets of the same media criticism as Shamima Begum. Like if I were them and I saw what happened to her, I would tell fucking nobody who I was. Yeah, that's very understandable. Yeah. And third, they quietly returned to the UK and their families and the authorities have kept this information private to avoid public backlash. But I think that's very unlikely. But I wouldn't say it's impossible. Yeah, I think I personally believe that they died uh, during the fighting. But that's just my personal theory. Right. Or like one died, one could maybe be alive in a camp somewhere, you know? Yeah. They're probably not. I mean, if they're dead, they're dead. But I highly doubt they're like together. Yeah, I think it's too late for them, you know, to be identified as such now. But that is the full story of the Bethnal Green Trio, which is actually the Bethnal Green Quartet. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you liked our episode, please do rate us and subscribe. And it will really help if you tell your friends and your enemies and your local mosque and so on and your study group and everything. Right. Speaking of the radicalization algorithm, please rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts to like drive us up. Yeah, please. We we do appreciate that. We do have a Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash doscriminal. And we have a new subscriber this week. So hello to Adrian Alder. Hi, Adrian. Yay. Thank you. We have a bonus episode about the Hillsborough Stadium disaster that just went up. We have the thing about Lisa Smith that just went up. I will post my paper on the women of ISIS, including screenshots for our patrons. So that's exciting. She's got the tea, folks. She is spilling Mm -hmm. the tea. Mm -hmm. And also send us your feedback and your requests. We like hearing from you guys. And since we're ending the Arab Uprising series for now, we want to do other stuff. Yeah, yeah. So please let us know. We've been working on a case probably for what, Amr, like two weeks from now. And every day my voice notes to Amr about it are getting more unhinged. So please send us more ideas. Yeah, she's becoming a full on crack. It's actually kind of amusing to watch. (laughs) Yeah, but thank you guys so much for listening. Yeah, have a good one, everyone. Bye. Bye.